the JLR interview series. Okay, so it's Monday afternoon, um, coming up to 3.45pm uh, UK time. And um, today we have a special guest from the east coast of uh, America. And her name is Tana Alexa. And um, it's really great to have her on the station. So how are you this morning in, in uh, the east coast? I'm well, thank you. Coming to you from... Uh... A gray and quite rainy New York this morning. Oh, okay. But uh, but I'm very happy to, to be here with you, and, and and so so glad that you uh, are having me on your show. No, that that's great. Um, and yes, it's uh, actually gray and rainy in London as well. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that that's quite normal. I'm afraid this time of year. So, um, I thought it'd be really interesting to get uh, Tana on today because um, she released a a really interesting CD called Honor um, in the spring, which you might have heard quite a lot now on uh, Jazz London Radio. We've been featuring it a lot on latest releases, and also Andrew Ficari on Jazz Doodles has featured it. So does Kevin Davey on uh, his show, and also Liv Fernandez. So uh, as you can see, everyone's really getting into it. So um, it's called Honor, and it's also been nominated for a Grammy, which is really nice to hear as well. It's fantastic to hear. <laughs> I still can't believe it when I hear it. Yeah, and it's it's on your sort of own um, label as well, so, so that's really good. I, I I don't have a label of my own, um, mm. but I, I self released the, the the project. It was a completely grassroots independent project all the way. I've done everything without a, a, a label, without a major distribution, without a manager. Until recently, without a booking agent. So basically, team of one. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, which is, uh, it's been an uphill battle the whole way. So to receive this Grammy nomination and this kind of recognition after all of the hard work that I've put into it for the last few years is, uh, is quite, it's quite something. Well, that, that's interesting. Before I get to the first question I was going to ask you then, I'll, I'll just ask you that. So, I mean, obviously, you know, you've had a, a limited budget and things like that, I, I would assume. So when it comes to, like, recording in a studio and things like that, I mean, was that a lot of, Pedals to jump. It was a lot of pedals to jump. Uh, you know, I mean, for for most independent artists, the the making music part of it is the least of our worries. It's usually the financing of it. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, one of the major blocks in in the road actually happened to be that I raised the money initially through um, Pledge Music, which was a crowdfunding mm-hmm, yeah. uh, platform, uh, which actually went into liquidation. Uh, and the oh. campaign money for thousands and thousands of artists was lost oh. and uh, was yeah. never paid out. So I raised, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for this album and wow. never received it, uh, which was, uh, which yeah. was a huge blow in the very beginning when I was mm-hmm. just putting together the funding for this project. So there have been many, many bumps in the road financially and otherwise, um, but I persisted and I continued to work on it and I continued to raise money. I got a grant. I was uh, the first recipient of the music grant of the Cafe Royale uh, Cultural Foundation of New York, which was a wonderful thing that helped me finish the project at the very end. Right. And uh, a lot of it went on the credit card. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, that's um, when you believe in a project and you have a story that you feel is important to tell, Somehow you you find a way to to, to realize the project. So oh yeah, I'm grateful that I was able to do it. Well yeah, um, well and congrats and, and well done on that. That's really good, and and good perseverance as well as you say. That's that's excellent. And um, you know, following on from that, I think it's quite an interesting album, which I want to ask you about the concept, um, which I I believe has an interesting concept behind it. Would you like to tell the listeners? Absolutely. So the um, the idea of Ona, its its premise, um, I developed it over a couple of years, but it really, for me, it crystallized uh, in 2017 after I attended the Women's March on Washington D.C., mm-hmm. which uh, was, you know people know it's the largest yeah, single protest it. in American history. Um, I was so moved by the powerful speeches that were given at the march that I. You know, and these stories of women and the way that they spoke about their experiences and their truths, uh, and 
it really f inspired me to look inward in my own family mm -hmm. and learn about the stories of the women in my family and the influences that their life experiences have had on my own existence and my own sense of freedom. You know, how do I stand here in this yeah. moment without having been influenced by the stories of the women who came before me? And so I, I, I began to put together these informal conversations with the women in my family, mainly my mother and, and my grandmother. Um, and through them and hearing their stories, I learned a lot of details that I didn't know before about the matrilineal lineage of our family, you know, the women mm -hmm. who came before them even, and, um, and uh, they, their experiences cross-culturally, uh, because my family comes from Croatia, so my mm -hmm. grandmother, her mother before her, her mother before her, they were all born in Croatia, they immigrated here, they were refugees in the United mm -hmm. States. So, you know, we have a very um, colorful history as a family in general, yeah. but these women served as the backbone to our family and really uh, are the reason that I, that I proudly stand here today, be, being able to feel free enough to produce a work like this. And uh, through their different stories, I, I decided that I wanted to focus the music on different elements of, uh, of a woman. Um, the woman, the woman's mind, the woman's soul, the woman's sexuality, mm -hmm. um, this struggle that we have constantly to redefine um, gender ascribed roles in society and in relationships. Yeah. And then finally, sisterhood and a woman's inner strength. Um, so really, Ona is a, is a musical story of my own self-discovery and resistance and, and, and uh, freedom to protest and a demand for change. Um, but it really represents on a global uh, aspect this basically feminine and free spirit that I really believe exists um, in every single one of us. Yeah, that's, that's a really powerful message. And, you know, um, following on from that, so you, you said your mother and grandmother were for creation. You were born in Croatia as well. I was actually born in New York. Oh, uh, you were born I in lived, New York. But I, yes, but I lived in Croatia for many years. And so oh, okay. I have this, this kind of third culture kid since so, so yeah, yeah. was here and there and then back here. Mm -hmm. So, but, but most of my family and my parents, they still live in Croatia. So for me, home, home is Croatia when I, when I go to see my family. Okay. Um, but but that was also a huge influence on on uh, you know in s listening to the stories of the women in my family. These stories, especially from my grandmother, with whom I speak Croatian, come to me in Croatian. And so the title track of the album Ona, which actually means she in Croatian, that's oh. the translation. Um, this, the lyrics I wrote them in English and in Croatian within the same song to represent the two most powerful female voices in my life, which are my mother and my grandmother. Wow. And, um, you know, like, that, that Women's March in 2017, and, you know, you've put together this, this record. Uh, do you see this record as a celebration of women, or do you see it as a continuation of a struggle? I mean, how do you see I, the I future? I see it as absolutely the, the celebration of women's evolution. You know, I, 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 it's not at all um, an anthem of hatred of men. No, no, quite the contrary. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really a, a, a focusing on the unbelievable developments that women have been able to achieve, notwithstanding uh, the struggles, mm. and uh, and how fascinating it is that women have achieved what they have been able to achieve and done so uh, so powerfully and beautifully. Uh, it's just, it's very inspiring. I mean, that, that experience that I had going to the Women's March and feeling the energy of all of those people, not only women, because there were men and women alike yeah, of course, at the yeah. march, um, just the, the need to support women voices and understanding how important that is for our culture, for our society, and for the future, it, it was um, it was really an inspiring moment in my life. Um, do you? What was the reason why they decided to, to put that much together? Because again, you know, you look at the United States and 
you know, superficially you'll say it's a, it's um, a pro- well, <laughs> a progressive country. I mean, yeah, we have, we have seen things happen in the last four years, yeah, we, yes. which we can't deny. But um, in general, it's seen as a progressive country. Uh, there should be opportunities um, for all. But so, why do you think they decided to put that much together at that time in 2017? I mean, at that time, you know, this was the, the height of the Me Too movement. Oh, yeah, of course, um, yeah. Where, where all of these stories were finally coming out that um, basically showed that women had not been listened to or at least had not been heard for years and years, uh, not believed. And so, you know, I think there was a, it was a culmination of there have been many, many... Uh, advancements for women in our society but there is this mentality that still exists that we all um, kind of fall victim to in terms of the way that we uh, regard women or disregard women the way that we see them and their successes the way that we are either inspired or intimidated by them you know there is um, I think with the rise of the Me Too movement there were so many things that were uncovered about the progress that we've made, but also the the work that we still have to do. And uh, with uh, the election of Donald Trump, I think there was this uh, this fire that ignited in most people, especially because of his uh, views about women and the things that he has said um, regarding women. And uh, it's it's been a powerful movement to mm-hmm. witness and to be a part of. It really has been. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, in my head. I remember one of his quotes. One of his yeah. many quotes. One was, "I cherish women." That was his quote. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're we're almost in January. <laughs> I can't wait until we just don't have to see his face anymore. Yeah, I um, interviewed uh, Regina Carter um, last month, just before the election, and that was a really interesting experience. I know she worked on your. Uh, can't record. She did. She was actually also nominated for a Grammy for yeah. Best Improvised Jazz Solo for uh, the, the the performance that she that she did on my uh, song Pachamama, which is also on the album. Yeah, that's just great. Um, I know her album is just amazing as well. So much, so much good music's come out this year. But you know, as we were going through the issues that um, black people have had over the years, what she was explaining to me as a black person who lives in uh, England. Um, and it's really interesting to hear, hear, hear what she had to say, what you got to say from a different perspective. Um, just one question that I'll ask you, um, because America has yet to have a woman president, for instance. Do you think that's something that you might see in your lifetime? I truly hope so. I, I really do think that we are ready as a country for that, even though probably more than half of the country is not. But uh, progressively speaking, I I think, I mean, to have an all-encompassing society, you need to have voices and perspectives from all that exists within that society. That includes women, that includes people of color, that includes people of different religions, that includes, I mean, we are, you know, the United States is one big social experiment because everyone comes from everywhere. Mm. And it's important that those who are responsible for our legislation, you know, the, the legislative things that happen in this country also reflect those who live in this country. And until this point, it has not been so. And uh, so I, you know, I think that there are so many interesting things that a woman can bring to the table um, just in the different kind of thinking that a woman has, a different kind of reasoning, a different kind of empathy, a different kind of life experience. There are, there are things that are just different about women. It doesn't mm-hmm. make them better or worse. It just makes them different. And so different viewpoints are what I think can really move us forward as a society. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 really interesting to hear. And uh, you know, I think of um, uh, the lady who's prime minister in New Zealand. Uh, I hope I pronounced her name correctly, just in the Ardern or mm-hmm. something along those lines. And she's definitely brought a different perspective to that country, um, in the way she tackled the coronavirus and, and other things. And that's really good. 
So you're I right. A, there was an article just this morning that, that New Zealand officially claimed that they are coronavirus free, 100%. Yeah, that is astonishing to hear. Astonishing. Yeah. But congratulations to them, you know, and they still have sports events and all sorts over there, you know, with, with crowds, when I, I should add. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and, you know, going back to your uh, album, um, I want to ask two more things. So the first is, who are the musicians on that you perform with, so the listeners so, can know? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the, the core band consists of... Uh, Antonio Sanchez on drums. Uh, he also co-produced the album with me mm-hmm. uh, and also played some additional keyboards. Uh, Carmen Staff on piano and keyboards and synth and uh, Fender Rhodes. Matt Brewer on electric and acoustic bass and Jordan Peters on guitar and effects. Um, there, you know, this is, this is my core band uh, who I knew could help me deliver this message uh, musically, sonically. Mm-hmm. But what my hope was for this record was to have a number of special guests, female special guests, oh. who, both musicians and, and artists alike, who have unique voices in their fields. And so all of the guests who are, uh, appear on the album are very, very different artistically, but they each have something unique to say. And that's what I wanted to show, that women's voices are important, women's voices are different, women's voices... Are, are unique. And, uh, and so, like we said, Regina Carter uh, guested on uh, one tune called Pacha Mama on mm-hmm. violin. Um, the incredible Stacey Ann Chin, a poet and spoken word activist. Yeah. Um, she performed an excerpt of one of her poems from a, a book of poetry uh, that she wrote called Crossfire. Uh, and uh, the poem that she she read from was called Raise the Roof, and it was actually a, a poem that she wrote for the Black Lives Matter movement, okay. which, you know, knowing what happened this year in the United States um, for the Black Lives Matter movement and, and all of the, the horrible things that have happened this year, it, it really feels powerful that, you know, when we recorded this in January of 2018, that she already had that poem Mm. You know, just it just shows how these these are such deep seated issues in our country uh, that need to change and, and unfortunately don't seem to change very quickly mm-hmm. or at all. Yeah. Um, so that was Stacy and Chin, um, and then we had the Rosa Vocal Group along with uh, Claudia Acuna, Nicole Zoraitis, uh, Sofia Rey, and Sarah Elizabeth Charles. There were two choirs on the title track of Ona. Yeah. The Rosa Vocal Group sings in Croatian, the basically the teachings of my grandmother. And then uh, Claudia, Sofia, Nicole, and Sarah, they sing the choir in English, which are the teachings of my mother. So it was beautiful to have those two, those two voices represented um, on that track. And then uh, there's the wonderful Becca Stevens, who also guested on the track, playing charango, ukulele, and, uh, and singing as well. Wow. No, oh, that, that, that's awesome, actually. And you know, I should I, I should kind of plug as well. That, um, I do something on jazz on the radio, which is regular listeners will be aware of, which is called um, I feature a female vocalist, a female instrumentalist, and I do that every Monday afternoon. And um, I, yeah, I've been doing this for quite a few years now, and it, it's worked really well. Um, and I, I do like female vocalists. I um, sometimes do a rock and blues as well. Because I've got a lot of rock and blues um, stuff, which I and I've interviewed quite a few of the artists. So, so it's really good to have lots of um, you know different perspectives, as you said. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about is you've done two covers as well. I did. I did. I, I now did this is really interesting to me. Yes. So you know, it's interesting that the the original songs that I wrote on the album come from my personal experiences. Yeah. They're all somehow connected to my experiences of being a woman, the, the roles that I have in my life, um, the, the things that I have experienced from afar as watching women in society and, in, and seeing their progress and our progress. Um, and the covers... Uh, there are two. Uh, one of them is from the Great Tears for Fear song, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, which I thought was appropriate, especially because of the fact that 
we are in this political dilemma in the world where it seems that every major world leader really wants to rule the world. Yeah. And that also happens to be my favorite song from the 80s. So it's just all kind of, I, I, I had been uh, always wanting to do a cover of that song and it just yeah. seemed appropriate and kind of, you know, a little bit of like a, a jab, a little comedic element that everybody really wants to rule the world. Uh, and then there's the the, uh, the cover and arrangement that I wrote for Massive Attacks Teardrop. Yeah. And um, the way that I connect that to the story is that there are certain pieces of music that make you feel something. And in this case, that song, I mean, I have to be completely honest with you, the Massive Attack version, it is something that just makes you feel sexy. And that's part of being a woman as well. And that's something that I wanted to expose on this record. So there are actually yeah. two songs that kind of address my sexuality. That uh, that cover is one of them, and then another one which I call Animal Instinct, my, my original composition. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, the thing is that, you know, a woman's sexuality is very much a taboo thing to talk about. It's, you know, we are, we are, expected to be sexual beings but not freely talk about how yeah. we are sexual and so this is something that i also wanted to bring attention to and and just be open and vulnerable about the fact that you know we we have feelings too <laughs> yeah i mean this is what makes the record so interesting it's very very innovative what you've done and how you put the compositions together and everything it you know there's a thread of uh, melody flowing and everything and, and um, I'm showing my age here, but I, I've actually seen Ted Fifth perform at Wembley Arena. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> With Alita Adams, I don't know if you remember her. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah, they, were, they did an album together and she uh, played on the album. Yeah, yeah so that was, that was a nice experience. But yeah, that um, song, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, is one of my favourite tunes from the 80s. Yeah. So uh, I originally played the two together show. recently on the original versus covers. So. Uh, it's, it's such a great song it's such a great song and then there's also a, an extra little side story to that uh, to that song is that it's also my father's favorite song <laughs> and, and there, there's also a, a, an original composition called You Taught Me which I wrote uh, for my father and about my relationship with my father mm -hmm. um, and before I had written or completed that song you know, he, he because I had written stories, uh, written songs. I'm sorry about my mother, about my brother who passed, okay. about my uh, my husband. You know, so I had written about all of these people in my life. And my father, while I was writing the music for this record, he said, "Tana, when, when am I going to get my two? Oh, I was just about to say, "You <laughs> two forgot." <laughs> So when I was writing the song, I said, you know what, I'm also going to take uh, your, your favorite pop tunes and I'll, I'll, I'll do an arrangement. So it just kind of, it, everything, it, and, and that's the, the beautiful thing about this record is that really the, the stories, they came to me. I didn't create, you know, it, it, it was almost as if I would write the music and then its story would reveal itself to me and yeah. how it related to this, this topic, you know, this, this theme. <laughs> Uh, that's good. I, I, I'm glad you didn't lift the hook. <laughs> um, okay, so um, that's great. So it's really, really interesting stuff. And um, before we finish up, I just really want to ask you about yourself. So I, I was aware that you've got Croatian uh, heritage, but um, you so you're born in New York, as you say, or in America. Yes, born in, born in New York City. Uh but to Croatian parents. To Croatian uh, parents. My, my father was a refugee. He came here uh, when he was 13 years old, um, literally on the boat. <laughs> and uh, my mother was first generation American, also oh. to Croatian parents. Oh, okay. But then as a family, we decided after the Balkan War to return to Croatia. My, my parents wanted us as kids, my brother and, and myself, to have the experience of finding our roots and to go back to the place where we're from and to really feel um, the connection to 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 our to their home and our home and so we moved as a family when i was uh, an adolescent and uh, i finished my primary school and high school in croatia and then returned for college so i, I spent about six years of my young adult life living in croatia 
-hmm. and then my parents never left, so they, they still live there. Oh, okay. In, in, uh, in Dubrovnik and Zagreb, respectfully. Res yeah, each respectfully. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and so when I go home, I, I go to Croatia when I visit my family. Um, okay, so, you know, um, how did you get into music then? How, was it through family or... Well, it's, uh, it's an interesting story. When I was three years old, I, I got lost at a, a children's birthday party. And my mother claims that she found me, after searching around the house of this birthday party, she found me in the basement and I had found a little keyboard. And I was plucking out nursery rhymes that I had heard uh, and would, you know, was trying to sing them and play them. And she thought that this was a stroke of genius. <laughs> and so she, she contacted the local conservatory of our town and, uh, and she asked if she could bring me in for music lessons. And they, the dean said you know, that uh, it all sounded very nice, but they didn't accept children under the age of six. And she pleaded with the dean and said, can I just bring her in? We'll bring a little keyboard and you, know, you can tell us what you think and maybe just give us some guidance. And so we went to this meeting, and I, of course I have no recollection of this, this is just from you know, the, my, my mother's story. But we went into this meeting, and I was very nervous apparently, and I refused to play. I was sitting you know, with my feet hanging, dangling off of the chair, and with my little keyboard in my lap. And I refused to play, and refused to play, I was too nervous. And then I, uh, I guess the dean repeated to my mother that, you know, thank you for coming. This is, again, why we don't accept children under the age of six. And, and uh, I guess in my child mind, I realized that this meeting was coming to an end. And so I played a little something, and the dean thought that that was impressive, and so she brought the piano teacher into the room. And the piano teacher came in, and I, again, refused to play, refused to play. And at one, I announced to the people in the room that I didn't want the piano, but I wanted to play the violin. And my mom didn't even know that I knew what a violin was. <laughs> and uh, so they brought the violin teacher in, and she opened her green velvet case. I still remember that. And she took out the violin, and I said, yes, that's what I want. And they said, well, that's wonderful, but you are too small. Your hands are too small. You can't even use one of those quarter-size violins. So we need to wait a year until your hands are big enough to play. And so, uh, again, this is all on the account of my mother who claims that almost to the day, a year later, that I came to her in the kitchen while she was cooking, and I said, Mama, I'm ready. <laughs> and she said, for what? And I said, I'm ready to play violin now. My hands are big enough. And so that's when I started playing violin. And so they put me on the Suzuki method, and I played very seriously for, for about 13 or 14 years. And uh, that was kind of my, my first musical calling. And, uh, and when we moved to Croatia, um, I didn't know Croatian fluently uh, because we had always spoken English at home. Uh, and so it was difficult for me or pretty impossible to basically enroll in a Croatian music school. So in order to connect with my English language and my expression, I put singing more in the forefront. I had always been singing, but that was basically my way of connecting with the English language. And somehow, you know, probably because my, my dad has a very eclectic musical taste, you know, in our house, everything was playing from Pat Metheny to Bob Marley to Bobby McFerrin to mm. Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, it was, it was a, a very musical house. And so I got introduced to jazz and blues and soul through his records. And uh, that was just kind of what I gravitated towards. And, uh, and actually it was Regina. When I met, when I met Regina first, uh, it was a number of years ago, um, I, I, I had been singing with uh, Michael Olatuja, who you probably know. Mm -hmm. who yeah, is, yeah, uh, yeah. Great bass player who's also from London and, and Nigeria. Yeah. And uh, we did a show with his band, Lagos Pepper Soup, in New York City. And Regina Carter was the, the uh, special guest of the evening. And so she and I got to share the stage together playing Michael's music. And, uh, and I would just, add, you know, when we were in between sets, I would sit with her and we would talk. And I told her about how I played violin for many years, but it kind of took a backseat to singing. And she said, girl, pick up the violin. You start practicing again. Do, do it. 
And so I did actually, and uh, and it was uh, a, a couple of years ago that I started to incorporate it into my live performance. Um, mm. And uh, with my husband's band, uh, Antonio Sanchez yeah. and Migration, um, I actually started playing violin uh, in, in his group. Uh, so we've been going on the road and wow. playing elect electric violin and singing. So. Wow, electric violin. That's been very, very, very fun. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine it, you yeah. know. That, that takes me back to the 90s, electric violin, you know, that Jean-Luc Ponty and things like that. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. No, it's great. Um, and I'm going to take the opportunity to plug, actually, um, my favourite Croatian um, athlete, Janica Kostelic. I don't know if you remember yes, her. Fear. Oh, yeah, she was amazing. Absolutely amazing. She retired too soon. It's a shame. She was, she was she, amazing. She and her brother, fantastic skiers. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Well, um, thanks for, for this great interview today. I've really enjoyed it. And I just want to say, oh, you're welcome. I just want to say, um, you know, good luck with the Grammy nomination. And hopefully you'll start get to start playing with your band soon, live. I hope not, so. not on video, not on video live, but real live. You know, yes, I hope so too. Audience and stuff. It's, that's definitely... Uh, uh, therapeutic thing that I think all musicians are missing and lacking yeah. at this point. You know that that uh, cleansing aspect of live performance that you can really only get with live performance. We yeah. miss that very much. Yeah, but at least the great thing, and um, really, there's been some absolutely fantastic music releases here from all over the world, from this country, from Europe, and beyond, and of course in America. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I, I, I hope I get to bring this music to London. Oh, I would, the, I would love to see. The last show that yeah. I did in London was at the Jazz Cafe, and it was just wow. such a fantastic show. Oh, yeah, great venue. So much fun, great venue. Yeah. And uh, I really hope to bring this music back. To yeah, London. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely look out for that for sure. Right. Well, thanks for the interview today. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. So much.
The JLR Interview Series.